Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, let me first uh, very briefly thank all of you for being here with us today, but uh, I have to thank Aisha and, and with her, all the, uh, the organizer of this Congress for giving us the pleasure more than the honor of addressing to such a distinguished audience for the first time. Um, I would like to introduce myself a little bit before starting my presentation and uh, I am representing here the European Society of Surgical Oncology. That is a society totally devoted to quality cancer care for specialist surgeons. And the reason why such a society exists, and I am asking and repeating this because we would like to see Russian friends and surgeons joining us, is that we should be extremely aware that by 2030, cancer will be the first cause of that worldwide. We desperately need quality surgery dedicated to cancer treatment because most solid tumors can be totally eradicated and cured by surgery only. But if you look at what happens throughout the world right now is that 95% of the tumors are treated by surgeons who are not specifically trained for cancer. So the core value of the European Society of Surgical Oncology is giving a surgeon the pivotal role to diagnose and treat cancer as an independent specialty leading the MDT, the multidisciplinary team of doctors surrounding the patient at the center of cancer care. And our strategic plan for the next year is totally patient-centered. So we have congresses, educational activities, we have uh, correlation with the advocacy group of patients, and we, uh, we give special uh, attention to our members with courses and the research support. So this is the title of my presentation today, and I decided to address with this uh, subject, not only because I'm a digestive cancer surgeon, but because I think this is the perfect example of what makes a difference between a, a surgical oncologist and a general surgeon who operates an organ. And uh, starting from the beginning of this story, I think that this one was one of the biggest achievements in surgical oncology in the last century. What Bill Heald has been describing standardizing the so-called TME uh, was a major advancement in cancer surgery for a terrible diseases, the disease that was affecting with the local recurrences a uh, high number of patients that were not totally cured before this idea. What is strange that this idea was never demonstrated by any trial. It is just a principle that came out and was, uh, was just uh, uh, demonstrated by facts more than data. And it perfectly applies to the new principles of the mesenteric surgery, identifying the planes that have to be followed because inside those planes, the lymphatics run, and inside those planes, a locally advanced tumor can be totally eradicated if you follow them thoroughly without interruption. Uh, as a matter of fact, the completeness of a total mesorectal excision can be measured by the pathologist, and there is a clear correspondence between the rate of local recurrences and the completeness of the so-called uh, mesorectum. But uh, this operation is not perfectly done 100% of the time. The completeness, that is the measurement of the quality of this operation is not 100%. There is always a seven to 5% of the cases that have incompleteness. And why? This is because there are some pitfalls that are unavoidable by conventional techniques. The first, pit, the first pitfall is closing the rectal stump without looking thoroughly to the distal margin. If we do this operation, under open or laparoscopy, at a certain point of our trip, we have to close the rectum, but we have no precise control at that moment to the distal margin. And there is a squeezing of the organ that is approximating the transaction lines without any control. And another pitfall is uh, anatomically, and laparoscopy and robotics at present have not completely solved this question because especially in male patient with a high BMI, with a narrow pelvis, the angulation of the male pelvis in the narrow face is so uh, severe that sometimes we have no control and no vision at the lowest part of the so-called complete mesorectal excision when it is 
the most difficult part. And you arrive at that point when you are tired and when you are very distressed, and that is the most important part in order to preserve the so-called um, um, circumferential margin of the tumor. So what is the innovation? The innovation is approaching this uh, golden part of the operation from the beginning, identifying at first the distal margin and going directly from the beginning to the mesorectal plane through a correct and virgin layer. So this is a cartoon trying to explain how in many countries of the world, this idea is, is rising up, is growing up, because it makes sense that a, 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 a surgeon, when he's fresh and ready to operate, looks at the tumor, decide the margin, and goes directly to the uh, transection or the dissection of the fascial layers. Uh, the idea has reached a consensus, a consensus that has been reached in Sangaland. You know, there is a very important conference about colorectal cancer and colorectal diseases every year in Sangaland. And uh, in this occasion, a lot of uh, people who is publishing and, uh, and giving cases to an international registry that are recording the cases of trans anal total mesorectal decision are meeting. And now we have a strong consensus about the fact that this operation is, is worthwhile because it contains per se the elements in order to achieve 100% of good quality complete resection margins. Sorry. So let us see how it can be done. You see, you start the operation with, a, with an endorectal tube, and you look at the tumor, and you decide what is going to be your distal margin. So we count two centimeters and a half, three centimeters, and we perform a purse string just where we decide that it is good and safe to perform the rectal section, section at the end of the operation. So, this is uh, uh, one of the moments where you need some additional skills, but a lot of uh, digestive doctors can uh, perform a, 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 f a physically contained first string there. Then you start to identify your section line, and, and the first thing is cutting the mucosa, as you see here, and then after the submucosa, you come to the first muscular fibers, as you see here, step by step, low power, in order to avoid any injury to the adhesion organ, and you go with a counterclockwise maneuver to the submucosal vessels until you reach the layer that is exactly the fascial layer. And you will be surprised how you will see pushing on the rectum and on the rectal stump, what we call these angel's hair, these fine structures of white fibers that are exactly the fascial plane. Actually, we don't have a fascia. We have a counterposition of two layers that are separated by traction and counter-traction, and you see the angel's hair that see that the nerves under, are on the other side, and the fascial layer identifying the lymphatics is all containing in the other part. So you move step by step, the lateral part are usually the more difficult to interpret, but training is essential in this phase. And while you are working around the total mesorectum dissection from below, there is another team of surgeons working on the other side, and they have already ligated the inferior mesenteric artery, and they are going down, 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 preparing the rectum and the descending colon up to the reflection of the peritoneum. When you arrive at this point, you see we are moving the prostate upwards, and we are identifying that difficult fascia very well with a quality that sometimes, and you see here, this is the rendezvous moment. So the surgeon from below is opening the fascia exactly where the reflection is, and on the other side, you see the light of the laparoscopic surgeon who is working. So we have a meeting point, and we, at the end, have performed a perfect dissection that is uh, very uh, close to 100% of complete resection line. Sorry. What is uh, incredible is that, in most in this series, the conversion rate that is always 
more than 5 to 10% in any laparoscopic series, laparoscopic or robotic, did not change the fact that you always observe 5 to 10% conversion rate. Conversion rate for T8 ME series, mine and others, is 0% because you work from below and you avoid the moment of difficult anatomical viewing that obliges you to move to an open operation. Of course, it is not a miracle if it is not all gold because there are new complications. In order to avoid this complication, we have to be extremely skilled because nobody before this kind of operation has observed urethral damages or CO2 embolism when uh, the pressure is opening some major vessel around the rectum. So we have to be aware that it's not uh, an easy thing to do. And uh, what I used to say, this is not a YouTube surgery. Don't go to the movies that you see like here in this Congress and try to do you all alone. You, you need a, a very thorough training and training should be standardized. Of course, there are new technologies coming out in order to avoid this new kind of complication. This is the use of ICG endocyanin in green in the urethra. We can plan our trip identifying the pitfalls that we are going to find studying, you know, a resolution of the pelvis uh, case by case. But what we need to do is understanding that the trainee should be an expert rectal surgeon, a laparoscopic surgeon that has to be trained by a group of people that are uh, able to identify any single possible pitfall in this operation. So we are trying to establish an international cooperative group in order to train people on TATME, and we do courses in my hospital, you are very welcome. Uh, they are supported by Medtronic, by Olympus. You can find uh, supporters and come and join us, or, or you can go to Barcelona, to Antonio Lassi, or to Leiden, where, where we do these courses with ESSO. So, uh, everybody is agreeing now that this can be a new solution. Uh, Data are, are being accumulated, and we have trials going on. I'm very sure, I'm pretty sure that it is going to be another additional advantage in rectal cancer surgery, and we are going to have evidence-based support to this in a very few years. But uh, with this purpose, let me talk a little bit on the fact that our uh, idea that was sponsored by Bill Hield can be applied everywhere in the digestive tract. So following the embryological plane that is connected to an organ development that contains all the lymphatics, can be the clue for achieving a so-called high-quality radical surgery. It, the idea is not new. Of course, Leonardo knew it from, from the beginning. But um, um, now, you, you, this man that you see here, Calvin Coffey from Ireland, from Limerick, is a professor of surgery who has dedicated his studies to identifying the development of the mesum in every single part of the digestive tract. And you can do mesum-oriented surgery in every part of the digestive tract from the esophagus to the rectum. Of course, it is no, it's not an, a, a totally new idea. You are, uh, you are all aware about the publications and, and papers by Professor Hohenberger from Germany, but the idea in his case was treating extremely advanced tumor going straight to the so-called high vessel ligation. High vessel ligation in order to reach the most radical operation. But the principle now that has to guide the modern surgical oncology is to do the best and the minimum that is sufficient to cure. And the best and the minimum uh, that is sufficient to cure is not going with the, with the very traumatic operation under open approach, to dissect organs from the posterior layers of the retroperitoneum in order to get a specimen like this. Of course, this specimen is uh, uh, much more linked to better results than bad specimens. But this is not because you are reaching a higher number of nodes. This is what uh, we don't like to, to do. We don't like to, do, to add more trauma to our patient in order to cure them with a high percentage of success. And if you look at the procedure by Professor Hohenberger, it was a very uh, traumatic operation with mobilization of the entire uh, uh, bowel, uh, bowel uh, group of uh, viscer, viscous. And at the end of operation, you had a total exposure of the inferior mesenteric vessels with uh, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of blood under open. Um, it is very similar to the Japanese idea of a, 
of a D3 operation. D3 needs, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, part of the concept identifying the idea that any tumor can be cured by tears. So if you have a localized tumor and you remove the first tear and the first tear is negative, you have been uh, doing a radical operation. If the first tear is positive, you need to go to the second tear. And if the second tear is, co is positive, maybe you can go to the third tier. And, uh, but this has never been confirmed by any data. In gastric cancer, everybody knows that the D3 operation do not add any advantage for survival. You cannot go to lymph nodes enlarging, enlarging, and enlarging. The key is not removing more nodes, but the key possibly is following the fascia propria, following the layer that is opposed to the so-called told plane, and it, it, it is the only intact sac containing all the lymphatics and the nodes that you are going to ligate at the origin. So the idea is that following the embryological structure, you can be curative without any trauma, because those planes are totally no bleeding. It can be done laparoscopically. Of course, you've not, uh, uh, in this case, you're not approaching the laparoscopic operation with the standard approach. You need to move your uh, instruments a little bit down below to the pelvis in order to walk along the mesenteric vessels. And you have to be very aware of all the variations of the iliocolic vessel and, uh, and the so-called Henle trunk, that is very, it's a disgrace for a surgeon if you don't know the many variations that you can have, but it can be done by a skilled surgeon, and I will show you some moves, some movements of this. You see, we have been, sorry, we have been, you have a pointer? We have, can we have some light off, please? Down. You see here, this is the opening of the sac at the level of the left side of the vein. And so just keeping up, just keeping up the mesum, we identify the vessel at their origin, ligating them, I, I will run, otherwise the time is short, sorry. And you see here how keeping up these uh, bag of nodes, at the end of a, the operation, you will have just naked vessel and no lymphatics at all in a totally avascular plane without any bleeding. And you can go on with this operation up to the level of the emergency of the right colic vessels, as you see here. And again, following the vascular plane and the, and the, and the, and the embryological layers, you see here, we, we are ligating the colonic branches of the handlet trunk. So you see the head of the pancreas that is totally naked. The specimen at the end of the operation is a perfectly dry specimen with intact layers. And what is uh, more important is that this specimen is uh, controllable by a pathologist. He can assess the integrity of the fascia. And there are trials going on, I will speak about them uh, later on, that are controlling the completeness, also measuring the, with, with the real-time uh, PCR the possibility of uh, remnant uh, embryolog uh, sorry, epithelial cell in the peritoneal washing after a so-called CME and after an ordinary uh, straight-off uh, hemicolectomy. So the results are very clear. What is surprising is that it is uh, not only associated with the advanced stages. Better results are observed in all stages, mainly because the principle of breaking the bed is creating the uh, possibilities of local or distal recurrences also in early stages when you do not respect the, the plane. And what is very interesting today is that you can do it also by robotics. And you follow exactly the same principle. What I do not like of robotics, beside of the COSA that you all know, is the fact that sometimes we are using old instrument for modern surgery, because in this case, we are using a monopolar. And monopolar, when you do a 
find a session along a vein is not the best instrument to be used because it's very uh, thermal damaging. But you can do it in a very thorough way because the robot eliminates every trembling of your hands and it gives orientation of your hands so you can do exactly the same operation with extreme delicacy and with extreme precision. I will show the next phase of the um, other vessels here, and you will see how the, the robot can be a wonderful instrument in your hands while you see it relaxed with your, uh, with your forearms that are standing like this, no movement, no mask, you are relaxed. And, uh, uh, you know, somebody told me, how do you like the robot? I mean, if I was driving a, a, a truck with dynamite in, I would not stay standing on my feet with my uh, back this way and rotating to look, at the, uh, to look at the screen. I would like to sit down very comfortably, look at the screen in front of me, 3D, precise vision, precise movements. So it adds a lot of quality to the surgery itself. So I would like to stop here because I would like to, to feel your perspective about this new way of approaching high quality cancer surgery in the digestive tract, avoiding trauma but adding precision. And digitalization and new concepts are helping. These are one of the most important things that will be discussed during the next Congress that ESO is celebrating in Rotterdam next October. So I am very glad to be here. I am ready for, for listening to your question and I invite you to Rotterdam. I would like to have a lot of friends from Russia there in next October. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Professor, for the excellent lecture. So I guess there's a time to open up.